Hey crew, it's Ben, and I'm back with some more so crates. Today we're going to be diving back into the works of Pluto. We are going to be talking again about Critias. This is the second half, and I think we might be able to get through it today in one sitting. So let's go ahead and dive into the description of Atlantis, which is the whole reason why I really began this at all, right? I didn't know about the hidden history in Athens and how that part of it had been pulled into the sea at the same time that Atlantis had gone down. I didn't know that. And that was good knowledge to have, the description of Atlantis I'm gonna incorporate in the game that I'm building, but or of Athens. But this part of Atlantis really tripped me out. Like I really did think it was a smaller island and maybe even like a city state, but it was a rather large island. It was a, a continent really, about like the size of Australia. And so what they had was uh, 10 kingdoms on this island with 10 different rulers who were all sons or, or all, all related. <clears throat> and now we're going to get into the physical description of Atlantis. And it's, it's some good stuff. Like I said, this is why I started even doing Pluto at all, or Plato at all. I say Pluto. But before I begin my account, I owe you a brief explanation in case you were surprised to hear of so many non-Greeks with Greek names. Now this is, <clears throat> again, this is uh, Critias speaking. He is about to speak on Solon, his great, his grandfather or great-grandfather, who heard about this stuff on his trip to Egypt. And it was from 9,000 years before that, which was 3,000 years before us to make a grand total of these events are 12,000 years before us and older. Uh, but some of these have Greek names, and he's about to explain that. You will now discover the reason for this. Solon, his great-grandfather, intending to make use of the Egyptian story in his own poem, found out on investigating the significance of the names that those Egyptians who had written them down initially had translated them into their own language. So he wrote, so he himself, having recorded the sense of each name, put them back once more into our language and wrote them down. So the names that are being used in the Egyptian stories are Athenian, Greek names. <clears throat> and these writings were, <clears throat> sorry, and these writings were in the possession of my grandfather and are in my own possession now. Indeed, I studied them carefully as a child. So, do not be surprised if you hear names of this sort belonging to our region. You have the explanation. Well, then the story, a long one, begins somewhat as follows. As was said previously about the allotments of the gods, they portioned the land into lots, some larger, some smaller, and instituted sacred places and sacrifices for themselves. And so, Poseidon, being allotted the island of Atlantis, settled his own offspring there, in a region of the island describes, described as follows. By the sea, towards the center of the entire region, there was a plain to, said to be of sublime excellence, and fertile too. And near the plain, towards the center, at a distance of some fifty stades, now, a stade is roughly 600 feet. Oh, so when we're talking about these, this would be 50 stades at 600 feet. So that is 30, about, about 3,000, no, 30,000, about 30,000. So about 30,000 feet for this, this uh, plane towards, at, near the plane towards the center at a distance of 30,000 feet. There was a mountain that was low throughout, and there was an inhabitant of that mountain, one of the men of the place, born originally from its soil. Now, this lends towards the non-off-planet interpretation of events for the creators. Uh, there are, you know, they, there's the story of Enki and Enlil. And <clears throat> how they came from off the planet seeking gold and how they were responsible for the creation. This is a somewhat different story, but the, some of the players are really kind of the same. And it's interesting to note that because I am making use of that in my game. <laughs> uh, there was an inhabitant of the mountain. Like This is one mountain, really. So this is a big island 
with the mountain. And now it's a, it's a range, but this one central mountain is the focus. And there was an inhabitant of that mountain, one of the men of that place born originally from its soil. Now, this mountain may be volcanic. It may not. It may be basalt ball like the Appalachians, which I personally believe. Like the, the mountain chain that runs for, in Appalachia runs in the highlands of Scotland. And I believe that there was also a section of that mountain range that fell into the sea and was submerged when the whole shift took place. So, uh, anyway. And his name was Evanor, and lived with his wife, Lucippe. And they had an only daughter, Cleato. And when the girl had reached marriageable age, the father and mother both died. Poseidon was smitten with desire for the girl and made her his consort. He secured the hill on which she dwelt, fortifying it by making alternate, alternating circles of earth and sea, some smaller, some larger and closing each other, two of earth, three of seawater, like round wheels in the middle of the island, equidistant from one another on all sides, so that they were impassable for people because there were, as yet, no ships and no seafaring. And he organized the middle of the island, an easy task for a god, providing two sources of spring water from beneath the ground, one warm, the other overflowing with cool water, and he sent forth abundant and plentiful food. <clears throat> this is an interesting creation story right here. This is <clears throat> this is an alternative creation for mankind. And this is Poseidon. So this is one of the gods, one of the the like Poseidon and Zeus was contemporaries. And so he is forming an alternative race here on these islands. Not just one. We'll see there's many, but they all start from the same seed stock. And this is one of those particular seed stocks, right? This is the inhabitant of the man <clears throat> was a, born originally from the soil. And so Poseidon could be Enki or Enlil or Nin or whoever, but from the others, he could be one of the brothers that causes all the strife. Like you have Enki and Enlil, and they fight, right? That their fighting over power is what brings about the destruction of mankind that comes with the flood in that story. And so this might be the same telling from a different perspective, right? This Poseidon could be Enki or Enlil. That's the premise I'm actually going with in my game, but it's a it's not necessarily a have to be, right? We will never know this. But on this plain, on this mountain, you have three could or five concentric rings, right? Two of earth and three of seawater. So you have the, the earth in the middle where he has isolated Cleto, and then a round of seawater, and then a round of earth, and then a round of seawater, and up to five, and some smaller, some larger, and enclosing each other. So complete circles all the way around of varying heights, but they're of seawater at altitude. And that's interesting. Like, there's not a whole lot of places you're going to find that. Now, if it was a salt source, located there and that the water was salty and they thought seawater but like this is saying that there's seawater on top of a mountain and that's that's weird unless it is a crater volcanic type thing right because then it could kind of fall in and you've got the plain and you've got the mountain and then it falls in and you could have the concentric rings on the interior but I don't know that a god's going to be building in the middle of a a volcano, like, I mean, maybe he knows it's extinct, but then he drills into it and builds some streams, so that's a little weird, too. And this is just me spitballing and speculating things, right? This isn't me trying to put anything into doctrine other than what I'm doing in my own game. But the whole reason for this was for me to, to read through this and get this description so I can make 
my island. Like I thought it was just going to be like the island of Atlantis with the city. and It's so much bigger than I thought it was going to be. And then he, he fertilizes it. Uh, he organized the middle part of the island, an easy task for a god providing two sources of spring water from beneath the ground, one warm and the other overflowing with cool water. And he sent forth abundant and plentiful food. Now, it doesn't say that the warm one was overflowing. It says that the cool one was. That's fun. That's interesting. Because you would think that the one that would overflow would be the hot one, that it would have the flow, right? But it doesn't say that. And having begotten and reared five pairs of twin male children, Here's another one of those, I don't, that's weird. Five male children, like that's mythology and I get that, but it was most likely probably half and half if it was anything. And he divided the entire island of Atlantis into 10 parts and assigned the mother's homestead to the eldest of the firstborn twins, including the surrounding portion of land that was the biggest and best. And he installed this son as king over his brothers and appointed the others as rulers, giving them dominion over large numbers of people and an extensive territory. He gave names to them all, naming the eldest, the king, after the whole island and the ocean too, which was called the Atlantic because the first ever person to exercise kingship there was named Atlas. His other twin was granted the extremity of the island towards the pillars of Heracles, as far as the region now known, now called Gadiera. The place was named after the son whose Greek name was Eumelos, though locally it was Gadieras in his own region, which is named after him. Now, let's pop over to the old earth right quick and see what we're talking about. Now, my belief is that this section right here is Atlantis. I believe that this is pretty close to the shape of the look thing and I think that right here is probably where we were looking for actual Atlantis the city. Right? It's south side of the of the mountain range, sea facing, there was a plain. This is probably our location right here. But this landmass extended a good ways like this lighter blue, and including this area here, was probably it. Like when it had the bulge and all of it was drawn up and it was exposed, this was probably Atlantis. And so the second part that his, his brother is getting, like he's got this part over here, and the second part that his brother gets is right here. And that extends into the mainland because this is conquered territory. They also control this pretty much up to here, according to the descriptions. Okay, so back to Cretaeus. And the place was named, okay. Uh, the second pair of the twins was called Amphires and Euamon, and the eldest of the third pair was called Menesis, while the other twin was called Autocathon. Now, the reason I say that it's probable that there are Half and half is because there are other Alcathons. This this word right here that is so hard to pronounce, Autocathon. There are other examples of that, and they're female. The eldest of the fourth pair was called Elisippus, and the other was called Mester. And the eldest of the fifth pair was called Aziz, while the youngest was called Diapres. Now, it is my thought that this right here is probably in control of the Azores, right? Which was, I think the Azores are over here, like right here. Yeah, this is the Azores. So Atlantis, the city proper, was probably over in this direction. Although it is interesting. Uh, hmm, that's funny. Uh, but it is interesting to notice that the Azores and this name are similar, right? They're not the same, but the Azaes. And while the youngest was called the Diapreppes. And all these brothers, themselves and their descendants, dwelt there for many generations, ruling over numerous other islands of that ocean. 
and indeed, as was said previously, governing all the peoples here within the pillars of Heracles, as far as Egypt and Tuscany. And from Atlas sprang an extensive and revered people whose king, the eldest son, always passed his title on to the eldest of his offspring, thus preserving kingship, the kingship over many generations. They acquired enormous wealth, such as no line of kings had amassed before or will easily attain in the future. They were provided with all the provisions they needed in the city and in the rest of the country. For although a great deal came to them from outside because of their extensive rulership, the island itself furnished most of the provisions of life. Firstly, it yielded whatever solid or fusible materials are extracted or mined from the ground, including a substance that now only exists in name only, but was then more than a mere name. This was orichalk, mined in various locations throughout the island, more valuable at the time than anything else except gold. There are a lot of <clears throat> theories as to what Orichalk is. Nobody knows. That is lost to antiquity. Maybe we will find a trove of it somewhere labeled. But barring that, there is only speculation as to what it could be. Most people assume that it is some amalgamation of the metals that we currently know, but it is not unlikely to me that it might be something completely different. It might be, they may have had raw, like raw and aluminum. I don't know. But it was something that, that glowed reddish in the light. And it was more valuable than anything else except gold. The island also brought forth an abundance of wood for carpenters to work on. It was well able to sustain animals too, both tame and wild. And indeed, there was a plentiful population of elephants. There, were, there was enough pasture available for all sorts of creatures, including those who dwelt in the marshes, lakes, and rivers, or indeed, in mountains or on plains. And enough in like manner for this enormous animal, by nature the most voracious creature of all. As well as all, this is the island brought forth, easily sustained whatever fragrant products were earth supports nowadays, from roots and herbs and trees and juices that ooze from flowers or fruits. There was also the cultivated fruit, the dry sort that is our sustenance, and these products we use as our source of food, consisting in general of what we call pulses, and whatever grows on trees, providing us with drink, with solid foods and oils, and tree-borne fruit that is difficult to store acting as a sort of pleasure and delication which we offer to the fatigued to relieve their satiety. All these were brought forth then in limitless abundance and wondrous beauty by the sacred island beneath the sun. So, being in possession of all these products of the earth, they set about organizing, building their temples, royal dwellings, harbors, and dockyards, and the rest of their territory, based on the following plan. First, they bridged the rings of seawater that surrounded the ancient mother city, creating a way out of and into their palace. They immediately built the palace at the very outset in the original dwelling place of Poseidon and his offspring, passing it on from one generation to the next, each adding to its adornments, each doing their best to continually approve upon the work of their predecessor until they turned their residence into a marvel to behold for the majesty and beauty it displayed. In fact, they dug a canal running from the sea to the outermost circle, three plethora wide. Now, a plethora is 100 feet, so 300 feet wide, 100 feet deep, and 50 stades long. And again, stades is 60 feet, or 600 feet. And in this way, they created a passage from the sea into the outer circle by opening up an entrance big enough for the largest ships to sail through. And what's more, at the bridges, they made an openings in the circles of earth which were separating the circles of seawater. Openings wide enough for a single trying to sail through. And they covered these from above so that ships traveled underground. 
for the banks of the earth and circles were high enough above sea level to allow this. Now, the largest circle, the one that were opened directly to the sea, was three stades wide, while the next circle, the earth one, was the same width as that one. Of the second pair, the circle of water was two stades wide, while the circle of dry land was again equal in width to the previous circle of water. The circle running around that central island itself was one stade wide, while that island on which the palace stood had a diameter of five stades. This island and the circles and the bridge, which was one plethora wide, they clo enclosed roundabout on every side with a stone wall. <clears throat> erecting towers and gates upon the bridges on either side at the sea crossing. They quarried the stone, some of which was white, some black, some red, from beneath the central island all over, and from beneath the inner and outer circles, and by quarrying the stone, they simultaneously hollowed out a pair of internal docks from which they covered over with native rock. Some of their buildings were simple, while in others they combined stone of various colors to amuse themselves, thus making them naturally pleasing to the eye. They covered the entire wall surrounding the outer circle with brass all around, as if they were painting it, while they covered the wall of the inner circle with a coat of tin, and the wall surrounding the Acropolis itself with oro, which gave a fiery gleam, or a chow. The palace within the Acropolis was designed as follows. In the center, on the very spot surrounded by a wall of gold, was a sacred shrine on untrodden ground, dedicated to Cleido and Poseidon. This stood in the place where their family of ten kings was initially begotten and born. To this very place, every year, the first fruits from all ten regions were brought as an offering to each of the kings. And there was also a temple to Poseidon himself, one stayed in length. Three plethora, three plethora wide, with its height duly proportioned to these dimensions, while its appearance was somehow foreign. The interior, entire exterior of the temple was overlaid with silver, except for the acroteria, which was covered with gold. On the inside, the ceiling was all ivory, decorated with gold and silver and orichalc, while everything else, including the walls, columns and floor was covered with war chalk. Within, they erected golden statues depicting a god standing upon a chariot, controlling a team of six winged horses, he himself being so tall that his head touched the roof. Round about this were statues of 100 Nereids riding upon dolphins, for people at the time believed that there were this many Nereids. And inside there were also various other statues erected by private individuals. Outside the temple gold stood golden images of the wives of the ten kings and their descendants and various other large statues of the kings and of private persons from the city itself or from foreign places over which they ruled. Their size and workmanship were in harmony with the overall design and the place was similarly well suited to the sheer scale of their rulership and glory of the shrine. They made use of both springs, the hot one and the cold one, each providing plenty of water, wondrously pleasant and excellent by nature. And they built dwellings around about and planted suitable trees. There were pools in the area, some cold and in the open air, others warm and covered over for use as baths in winter. There were separate pools for the kings and private citizens and for women and others for horses and various beasts of burden, with appropriate facilities provided in each case. The overflow was channeled to the Grove of Poseidon, which, because of its excellent soil, contained a variety of lofty trees of exceptional beauty. beauty. <laughs> they also channeled the water to the outer circles through pipes running along the bridges. There they had constructed many shrines to various gods and gardens with gymnasia of plenty, some for the men, some especially for horses. On each of the two circular islands, and in particular, in the middle of the larger island, there was a racing track reserved for horses, which was one stade wide and whose length was the entire circuit of the entire island. 
and this space was set aside for equestrian competitions. And around the track on either side were guard houses for most of the bodyguards, although the more trustworthy among them were posted on the smaller circle, closer to the Acropolis. While they were most, most eminently trustworthy of all were allowed to reside within the Acropolis, close to the kings themselves. The dockyards were full of triumphs, and all of their necessary equipment and everything was at the ready. And that is how the residence of the kings was arranged, but beyond the three harbors, outside them was a circular wall beginning from the sea. Everywhere, fifty states distant from the largest circle and its harbors, circling back to the same place where the mouth of the canal opened to the sea. The wall was densely populated with a large number of houses, while the canal and the largest harbor was full of ships and traders arriving from all quarters, so many that they produced a fantastic commotion in den, day and night. Well, I have now given a fairly good report of the city and the environs of the ancient dwelling places recounted then. I should now attempt to recall the nature and arrangements of the rest of the region. Firstly, the place was said to be elevated, with sheer cliffs rising out of the sea, while the entire area around the city was a plain. Enclosing the city, itself enclosed by a ring of mountains stretching as far as the sea. The plain was level and smooth and elongated throughout, 3,000 stades in one direction and 2,000 stades inland from the sea at its center. So that's another 2,000 on the other side of that. And this particular section of the entire island was south-facing and sheltered from the north winds. The mountains around the city were lauded at the time for their number and size and beauty, surpassing anything we have nowadays. <clears throat> in the mountains, there were many prosperous villages with local populations and, <clears throat> and rivers and lakes and meadows that could adequately support all the domesticated and wild animals and an abundant variety of timber, more than enough for any crafts at all. Now, the plain by nature, and because it had been cultivated by many kings over many years, had the following characteristics. It was originally four-sided, oblong, and for the most part a rectangle, but whatever it lacked in this respect, they corrected by digging a trench around it. As for the depth, width, and length of the trench, it's, it is incredible to relate how any works of human hands could be so vast, when compared with our usual endeavors. But I must tell you that what I heard in any case. It was excavated to a depth of one plethoron, which is a hundred feet. And it was everywhere one stage wide, which is six hundred feet. It received, wait, while its length running around the entire plain was a thousand stages. Now, that is a consistency error because the plain is three thousand stages by four thousand stages. So... Now, maybe it was sectioned off into 1,000 state pieces, and that seems to be what is meant, but it's not really conveyed well. It receives the waters that flowed down from the mountains as it encircled the plain, and arriving at the city and from both directions, it was set out on its course out to the sea. So it comes from the mountain down, that ever-flowing cold water, comes down and fills the channel and it appears to go out a thousand states this way and a thousand states this way and then go out towards the sea. And there's channels cut between. We'll see in a second. And each of the channels stood and, wait, uh, and it was set on its course out to sea. Further inland from the city 100 from the city 100 foot wide straight channels were cut across the plain emptying again into the trench on the seaward side. Each of the channels stood a thousand stades apart from the, each other, and these were used to transport wood from the mountains down to the city and for conveying the rest of the seasonal produce and set ships. By cutting cross channels sideways and connecting the channels to one another in the city, they took two crops from the land each year, relying upon the rain sent by Zeus in the winter and in the summer upon whatever the earth produced when they irrigated it from the channels. So this is like a, a cross section of, of 
channels. Huh, that's interesting. And I know that this is mostly just like sonar, but it is interesting. This might be worth somebody digging into and trying to look things up. Well, we'll come back to this in a minute, though. Out of the total number of men on the plane fit to bear arms, it was decreed that each lot was to provide one leader. And the size of the lot was 10 stades by 10. And the total number of lots was 60,000. That's big. And from the mountains and the region in the general, there were, according to reports, an enormous number of people, all assigned on the basis of their localities and villages, to these lots and their leaders. Each leader was directed, for military purposes, to provide one-sixth portion for a war chariot, for a thousand chariots, two horses with riders, and a team of two horses without a chariot board, including a fighter with a light shield, and a driver for the pair of horses who was to remain with him, two hoplites and two archers and slingers, three light-armed stone throwers, and the same number of javelin throwers, and four sailors for the ships whose full fleet numbered 1,200. So this is how the military equipment of the royal city was organized. The various arrangements of the other nine cities would take too long to recount. The distribution of positions of authority and of honor was from the beginning as follows. Each of the ten kings had authority over the people and most of the laws in his own region and his own city, punishing and executing whomsoever he wished. Their authority over one another and their communal affairs were subject to the edicts of Poseidon and the law transmitted to them, as did the inscriptions of the first kings written on a pillar of Orochalk, placed in the central island, in the sanctuary of Poseidon. There they gathered every fifth or sixth year, alternately, thus showing equal respect for the even or the odd and even portion. And when they met, they deliberated about their communal affairs, inquired into any transgressions by any of them, and passed judgment. And when they were about to deliver their judgment, they first gave pledges to one another as follows. <clears throat> There were bulls roaming free in the sanctuary of Poseidon, and the ten kings, being present on their own, prayed that the god would select a sacrificial victim that was pleasing to himself. They then hunted with ropes and with wooden weapons containing no iron, and whatever bull they captured they brought to the pillar and cut its throat with the top of the pillar, drenching the inscription with blood. Now, inscribed on the pillar in addition to the laws was an oath calling down mighty curses on those who disobeyed. So, when they, had their, when they had sacrificed in accordance with their own laws, they would dedicate all parts of the bowl, and having blended a mixing bowl with wine, they threw in a clot of blood on behalf of each of them, and having first cleansed the pillar, they poured the rest of the blood into the sacrificial fire. After this, they drew off some wine into golden vessels and made a libation over the fire, swearing an oath to judge in accordance with the laws inscribed upon the pillar, to punish anyone who had previously been a transgressor, and furthermore, never intentionally to transgress any of the ordinances, nor to exercise or submit to any authority, save in accordance with the laws of their father. Having sworn all of this on his own behalf and on behalf of their succeeding generations, each of them drank and offered up their vessel in the sanctuary of the God. Then, having spent their time engaging in the banquet and any necessary transactions, they all, once darkness had fallen, robed themselves in the most beautiful purple raiment and sat upon the ground by the embers of the ritual fire and by night, with all of the fires in the sanctuary extinguished, they delivered and submitted themselves to judgment. If any of them accused the other of any transgression, and when the light returned, they inscribed these on the tablet of gold and dedicated this along with their robes as a memorial. Now, although there were many other particular laws concerning the rights of the several kings, the most important that they would never bear arms against one another, that they would all provide assistance if someone tried to overthrow the royal family in any city, that, in accordance with tradition, they would deliberate together on military issues and general concerns, 
granting leadership to the house of Atlas, and that the king was to have no authority to put a kinsman to death without the agreement of half of the ten. Such was the nature and the extent of the power in the regions of the time. The god, however, arrayed this power and set it out, set it against our region, and the motive for this was said to be as follows. For many generations, as long as the nature of the god held sway in them, they were obedient to the laws and lovingly disposed towards their kindred god. For their thoughts were true and universal, dealing with one another's one another and life's chance events with wisdom and humility. So, they despised everything apart from excellence, thought little of their possessions, and easily bore their heap of gold and other acquisitions as if it were a light burden. They were not drunk on luxury, nor did they flounder because their wealth robbed them of self-control. Being so reminded, they clearly saw that through communal love, accompanied by excellence, all these material goods increase. But the more seriously we take them and the more honor them we do, the more they diminish while excellence perishes along with them. So, based upon such reasoning as this and with the persistence of their divine nature, all the wealth we previously described increased. But once the divine portion within them became faded by being mixed again and again, with such mortality, their human character became dominant. They were unable to bear their possessions. Their behavior deteriorated, to, and to those with eyes, they were an obvious disgrace, for they had destroyed their most sublime and precious of possessions. But to those who were unable to see what in truth constitutes a happy life, these people seemed at this stage to represent the very pinnacle of goodness and happiness, despite being filled with unjust ambition and power. That is us today. When we rule justly, paying no mind to the goods and services and all of the things that come from doing a good job, but doing a good job, regardless, we were blessed. But when we get the focus on the money, things fall apart. And that is why we are in the current situation today. Zeus, God of gods, who exercised his kingship through the laws, since he was able to view such matters with clarity, recognized the wretched plight of this fair race and decided that they should meet with justice to chasten them and make them more orderly. So he gathered all the gods together in their most hallowed dwelling place situated at the very center of the cosmos with a clear view of the entire realm of becoming. And having assembled them, he said, The end. That is all we have of this particular scroll. Oh, it does have a footnote that, that since there were 60,000 lots, there were 240,000 sailors, and with 12, 1,200 ships, that means there are 200 sailors per ship. Uh, one other quick note is that if the theory that I hold is correct about the 12,000 year disaster cycle, Atlantis was not here, but rather on this side because the Earth was tilted. And so what I think is, is that because the earth was in this position, the south facing was with good possibility right here. And we have a square plane. We don't have a whole lot of channels, right? So if we had better resolution, maybe we could see some channels cut into the square plane with the north side being this mountain range. Right? And so... That's what I believe about that. And you can take it or leave it. It is whatever. It's pure speculation. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a not too difficult topic, right? We're dealing with some history that can never be proven. Unless we find evidence of Atlantis in some location, this can never be proven. Nobody can ever say definitively this is where it's at. We can only speculate this is where I think it's at. I showed you where I think it's at. Y'all let me know where you think it's at in the comments down below. This is going to wrap up us on Criteus. We will be diving into some more works of Plato. And we will be running through most of the works of Plato. I wanted to get this one out of the way. Because this is important for my other work. The other things that I do. I am building a game based off of mythology. And this is going to be a heavy part of what I am doing. And so I wanted to 
to get it right. I wanted to make sure I, I read it for myself. And when I read it, I was like, you know what? I got to share this with the crew. And so that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing this whole uh, Play-Doh thing at all. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me. And I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. And you are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. This has been Pitt State. Peace.